The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Great to have you in on Thursday. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, and you. Hope you're doing all right. Uh, A lot to get into today. We'll spend some time with Brandon Vogel from HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. Vogels will check in in about 20 minutes or so. And in hour two, uh, loaded up, we'll say hi to Gary Barnett, a longtime coach in Colorado and Northwestern, and then uh, an extended sit down with uh, former Nebraska assistant coach Ron Brown. So, uh, Coach Brown going to be with us at 525. Numbers for you to get in, 489-1240, 489-1240, or can email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. As always, uh, welcome to tweet at us at Schmidt underscore radio at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. And uh, always find the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed. Can watch the show that way at H Varsity Radio and uh, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. So running down what's on the docket today, Husker Baseball. We spent some time with Evan Bland yesterday talking big red baseball. A development here is things get underway at 5. I think the network... Gets to pregame at 4.30. No Bryce Matthews in the lineup. So that is uh, interesting. Uh, Nebraska completely motivated uh, to, to pay Purdue back a little bit and get the best seating they can for uh, for Charles Swab next week. So we'll see where things go with Nebraska baseball. The first to potentially three against Purdue this weekend. Uh, you have Mr. Wynn has declared... Well, I'm going back to the SEC as he has uh, committed to Ole Miss. And you have to believe that Wynn is somebody that uh, Ole Miss is gladly going to take. He was a guy that was penciled in for some some big-time snaps, we'd like to think, for Nebraska. But uh, back in SEC territory, a uh, longtime man at, at Bama that found his way to Lincoln last year, now back in the SEC uh, we'll get into some NIL thoughts. Really interesting on three article about the market, the landscape of NIL, how it's changed. Some NBA thoughts last night as well. We'll get to what Miami and Jimmy Buckets did. That was super impressive. Boston, not so much this postseason at home. And the Heat take a 1 0 lead. Elijah's going to be sweating out his uh, Nuggets and Lakers tonight. Maybe or are you uh, you feeling okay? I feel pretty okay on this one. <laughs> I, I, I think you're not selling me. If there is anything from Game One to take away, and I don't want to go too deeply into the woods here on Nuggets and Lakers. This is a, a Husker theme talk show, and we'll get back to that here in just a second. But whenever I look at that game, I think the Nuggets' performance. Whenever you look at their their season averages as a whole. The Nuggets game one performance is more sustainable than the Lakers game one performance. I think both of those performances like from each team unsustainable in their own right. I don't think the Nuggets are going to shoot that hot from three. And I don't think the, the Lakers are going to shoot that hot from three moving forward in the series. But uh, the Nuggets, I think, played closer to the level they've played out all year was the Lakers. I really took advantage of a, a slacking Nuggets defense in the second half. I do think that the Nuggets team kind of ran themselves out just a little bit in the first half, and they showed some tired legs in the fourth quarter. Uh, I think a second game in two days at altitude will have more of an effect on the Lakers, and, and I, I like the Nuggets' chances tonight. I'm not sure about a cover. I think it's going to be another close game. I don't think the Nuggets are going to blow them out in the first half and have to hang on from that, that point forward. I, I think this will be a little more closely contested throughout, uh, but I think we're going to get lower scoring. I think the Nuggets are going to pull it out because I think they should have too much talent from, from top to bottom one through eight on that roster whenever you compare it to the Lakers how do you feel about 100 days till college football is it gonna fly by yes I think it will we're gonna blink we'll get into summer it'll be media days and then soon enough we'll be uh, at the graduate in uh, Minneapolis getting you ready for kickoff on the 31st road show tomorrow we are at Haymarket Park here in Lincoln as we get ready for the Salt Dogs 
home opener tomorrow night. So uh, at Haymarket Park, four to six. Excited about that. Good to be out on the road uh, again. I know you'll be back here. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm hoping. So Connor took the first opening road trip with the Salt Dogs. That yep. was kind of his vacation back home to Chicago following the end of his UNL semester, and now he's going to be back in Lincoln. So I, I think. The current plan, maybe not the full show, but to get uh, at least Connor up there for a couple segments with you and give him a taste of a, of a road show instead of being stuck back in the studio. That'll be good for him. <laughs> He's been chained to the studio so many times in the past year that it'd probably be good for him to get out, get out of the studio, you see just some sunlight. Get, you get that gaze from Connor like he's just, it's like he's being punished or something. Uh, at least the air conditioning's been fixed in your studio. Has it been? Well, I mean, you're not. You're not beat red all the time, sweating it out. Well, it's it's only May. <laughs> it's that's true. That's true. I, I remember a hundred years uh, spending spending time in there. It's uh, all good. Oh, there, there's been some summers where the Salt Dogs play, and we don't do a video stream for those, so it's tarps off in here, like trying to stay cool. <laughs> We're using the shirt as a fan. What the hell are all these empty water bottles doing in here? <laughs> and uh, why isn't anyone recycling? Let's uh, let's spend some time on on what is going on with nil. This is really interesting. It is pretty cool. Great find by you with this story. And put yourself in a head coach's position or an AD's position, and you've seen how things have worked. You've you've also heard the urban legends of player recruitment, legal or illegal, for, for years. You know some of the main actors and players – and, of course, programs in that, that story. Uh, the SPN did a 30 for 30. Pony Excess, SMU, the death penalty. What the uh, reality was 40 years ago, you had some J.R. Ewing type named Sherwood that had a payroll to meet, okay? And you had a payroll down at SMU. Well, you have a real live legal payroll with NIL, Uh, Name, image, likeness, that's the way of the college football world. And if you're a collective, if you're a football program, if you're an AD, I know there are lines that that don't or are not allowed to get crossed. The collective's the collective. All that said, you, you have a number. In some instances, if you go back a calendar year, that you had to meet. It wasn't just fit. It wasn't just coach. It wasn't just connection. It was zeros, as in how many zeros am I going to get to come to your school? And you you look at how things kind of kicked off when when NIL came to be, the saga between Ohio State and Texas and and Quinn Ewers. Mm. As Ewers made a boatload of money to go to Ohio State only to transfer back, and he went to Ohio State because he could. And you could not take money down in Texas uh, as a, a high school player. I think that's how the story shook out. And then he ended up transferring back to Texas. And until he got dinged up, he was doing pretty well against Bama for a first career start. So when you look at elite high school recruits a year ago, odds were that the school had a presentation of about a million dollar offer. The recruiting world was buzzing over the the five-star quarterback, Nico Analeva. Uh He's the $8 million man at Tennessee. Uh, to win on the recruiting trail, you had to have lucrative NIL offers appear to be uh, in the running, in contention, and it worked out. And, and Nico is still at Tennessee. He's a guy that could, could win the job. Uh, Hendon Hooker is gone to the NFL. So things have stabilize just to touch a year later as those financial packages right now in some instances are probably seven figures like you, you've got a handful of five-star guys probably for the 2024 recruiting class that, that can command seven figures but for the most part elijah the, the market now is saying look it's six figures and what you you, you have a lesson learned and I think case in point, just because you've invested heavily financially and you've landed a bunch of four- and five-star guys, that's not going to equal success. And we're talking about Texas A&M. They've kind of had to learn the hard way 
with a number of high-profile guys. Now, I'll say this. Defensively, they were really good a year ago. They held teams to 21 points, and a lot of those high-profile, high-star guys did well, but their offense sputtered. They didn't do what they needed to do offensively, and hence you had a very disappointing season in Jimbo land. Yeah, and uh, what's what's kind of interesting about this story uh, to me is is how this market has cooled because, I mean, you have the, the report out there from uh, an anonymous 2024 quarterback saying you hear about guys making Nico money, $2 million a year, $8 million over career. And it wasn't, like, eight, it wasn't $8 million a year. It was, it was $2 million a year to, for a total of $8 million. Yeah. And, and he said from talking around to recruits that I know and guys that are in the transfer portal, it's a very, very small percentage of guys making that money. He said uh, m- most of the guys that he talks to anywhere in, from $100,000 to $500,000, which is still a big chunk of change, but the guys that are getting a lot more, that's a small percentage. And, and what does this come from? Uh, there was one paragraph that I thought was really interesting where it talked about how these, these NIL collectives that sprung up were kind of coming into the Wild West, as we've talked about multiple times on this show over the past couple of years. You didn't know what the value of a player was. It was described as being whatever a school is willing to pay. That's the value of a player. That's changed. You have coaches that have conversations with the NIL collectives talking about what positions that they are putting a premium on in any given recruiting class. And you also have collectives that are going back and forth and talking to each other, talking to your friends in the business world and saying, hey, well, what kind of numbers are you guys putting out there for players? And with all that combined guys not seeing returns on their investment not yet anyway added conversations the the market itself just has cooled as a whole whenever you realize okay if this collective over here that was giving a guy two million dollars last year is now reining things back in and given the the same caliber of player five hundred thousand dollars why are we going out and and paying whatever we're willing to pay whenever we know what the competition looks like so it's just interesting that as time has gone on you're not getting as much of that that texas a&m and jimbo where when this was new and people thought we can go buy a roster uh the the money was flying around and now as as people learn and and people have more open communication about what i what nil is and, and what the return on investment is these numbers have pulled back down into a more manageable level. It's one of those things we're not hearing about because, again, another thing we've talked about in this show, the numbers aren't public. We don't know what any given player is making. You hear reports, you hear rumors, but but no one truly knows, and it sounds like the market is cooling down in that sense. We we need a ledger. We need to see the ledger, and we, we've seen it go sideways, not only from guys that you invest a ton of money on, that aren't ready to perform at all conference or all American level as an 18 year old. That's quite frankly, foolish to expect in the sec or in any league. And then you also have uh, buyer beware situations or stories of caution. Look at the, the mess with the university of Florida, where they were in on a, a high profile quarterback. 13 million was the number reported. Uh, hey, uh, my envelopes a little light. <laughs> Okay, I don't quite have the money we talked about. Here's what I can do for you. Uh, no, that's not what we talked about. See ya. I mean, I, I think there's instances, too, where the kid was promised one number. Here's the real number. And uh, that wasn't OK. Well, and I think that's a part of what we're talking about with collectives and, and NIL funded ventures becoming more open and honest with their with their transparency, their communication. Uh, this report here says I mean, we heard from Texas A&M, as you've laid it out, Ryan Day mentioned it, Nick Saban mentioned it, like, to, to run a roster, and this is, we're talking 12 months ago, that the prevailing thought was you need somewhere in that 15 to $20 million range per year in order to effectively bring in the, the kind of talent that you need. And now, uh, the report this year, that the story that we're talking about is the top programs, they're hoping for a bankroll of $8 million per year. And whenever you have promised a guy $8 million as of a couple years ago, whenever you thought you were going to need $20 million a year, where is that money going to be coming from now that you realize, you know what, $8 million a year is all we need to, to pay an 85-man roster, which averages out $95,000 a year. It's still a pretty big chunk mm-hmm. of change, but it's not the same as $20 million divided among 85 guys. There's less money to go around than some people were expecting a couple of years ago. Well, and the rate now sounds like it's between a hundred k and half a million. That's that's the range. And let's, let's do some math here. If you're a program that has means, that has financing, that has that investment group that really loves their their football program, are you going to put all of your chips in on one horse that is going to be that that game changer, that difference maker, or do you spread out some of the the loot? And I don't know, go say 
get a couple of stud de- defensive ends that are good on first, second, and third down, can get after the quarterback, and then go go get me a couple of offensive tackles and maybe a game changer at running back, or you just divvy it up how how your roster needs. I mean, you could you can spread that money around and put a really good roster together versus the the Nico route with with, with what Tennessee oh, yeah. did. We're using a quarter of this year's funds are on our quarterback. Whenever we could use that exact same money to go get ourselves an entire offensive line, which makes more sense to me because you win on the line of scrimmage. And maybe and that makes more sense to to us having watched Nebraska over the past couple of seasons. <laughs> just just because you've had good quarterbacks here, you've not had. The, uh, the the help around. Quarterbacks uh, that are good enough to win. Yes, you have. And it comes down to projecting, too. I mean, quarterbacks are hard, hard, hard to project. Can they come in and, and go win a job? Are they ready for this level of football? How are they going to take not being ready for this level of football and waiting their turn? And do they leave? Does that investment go up in smoke? Uh, the initial dollars and cents anyway. And when we talk about projecting quarterback, you can look at their opponents and you hope it translates to big-time college football. Brandon Vogel's with us in Hour 2. Gary Barnett and Coach Ron Brown at Tail Varsity. A Thursday were presented by Currency. And now. And now. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Good story by Andy Staples, and it's titled One Question. Don't give me coach speak. Give me honest answers. Uh, we'll get there in a little bit. Brandon Vogel with us, HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. Managing editor, author, Dream Like a Champion with John Cook. You find him on Twitter at Brandon L. Vogel, and he's hunkered down in his football office. Vogues, how we doing? What's up? Oh, not too bad. How are you guys doing? We are good, man. We are uh, happy that it's Thursday. Uh, the question I'm going to ask you, and I don't want to uh, coach speak, if Brandon Vogel was setting a budget for an NIL collective, an annual budget, what would that number be? Uh, it depends on where you're at. Um, I think Let's just say you're in the Midwest in a Power 5 league. Okay. <laughs> Iowa State. Got it. <laughs> wow. It's not where I was going. A little further west, my friend. So uh, I'll, I'll walk you through my thought process here. I think, if I'm not misremembering this, I think Ryan Day said it was going to cost probably $22 million a year to keep his roster together is what he anticipated. Now, you have to assume that coaches are uh, – exaggerating a little bit kind of playing up the scare factor of like hey look at this beast that we've unleashed with collectives and kind of a totally unregulated market i'm going to guess it's less than that for ohio state i put it maybe at 12 to 15 so if you're say a program in ames or iowa city or maybe even lincoln um i'm guessing you're probably at 10 10 million okay that's fair what how would you spend it (laughs) would you go with the uh the giant T-bone, or would you get some great sides uh, and maybe go with a pork chop that's a little less expensive? Yeah, I think I think you want to create the most complete, uh, fairest meal possible rather than splurging on the, the, the tomahawk ribeye for two, even though it's just you. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, it depends on what you need, of course, too. Like, if you're a program that's like, Say say we are talking about Iowa, where you're like, well, we know we're going to play defense, like, you know, the devil's business. That's no that's no issue. Uh, we feel good about the pressured running back we've got coming back, and say they don't have Cade McNamara. Maybe it makes makes sense to spend as much money as you can on on a quarterback. But you know, broadly with with NIL, like I, I have a really hard time believing you're going to be able to buy your way to winning. Um, I think what this is going to be is that the programs are going to settle into the hierarchy that's already pretty well established, which is that Ohio State's going to have more money than anybody in the Big Ten. Nebraska's going to have more money than a lot of places because of its fan support. But if you took Ohio State money, let's call it $15 million, and gave it to Wyoming, and they get to use that for five years, do they all of a sudden become Ohio State? I don't think they probably do. I think they'd probably do pretty well in the Mountain West, though. I'll tell you what, uh, that Wyoming team would be something dangerous for uh, for the group of five programs. But, Brandon, I want to get your thoughts on just how to use these these funds wisely because, 
as it's kind of been laid out, we don't know exactly what every school has to work with. We're thinking somewhere in that eight to twelve million dollar range is uh, somewhere that your your yearly bankroll needs to be. And as we learn more and more about NIL, do you think we're going to start seeing a trend towards? Uh, the NIL really being saved for transfer portal guys, known commodities. That's been one of the dangers of NIL thus far is you don't really know what you're going to get from an 18-year-old kid coming out of high school. You're going to get the next uh, Trevor Lawrence or are you going to get the next Tate Martell? Well, what are you going to be getting with that investment you're going to be making in quarterback? So do you think it's going to become a point now where, you know what, you go to the school, it's the best fit, you go try to make a name for yourself, and if you want NIL money down the road, you enter your name into the transfer portal and see where the highest bid is because – I mean, just like in business, you don't want to spend a lot of money on taking a chance. You'd like to spend that money on the known commodity. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good thought. Um, you know, maybe you're looking at a your total NIL money available, like a 60-40 split or, or something like that. And I mean, it's it, you're going to have tiers within each of those. Like, you know, you're probably going to have to put together a different NIL, NIL pitch for your high school quarterback than you would your your high school defensive lineman or linebacker or whatever. But um, being able to, because the transfer portal, particularly this second window, gets super, super competitive for players because everybody knows, like, okay, we had last season, we've been through spring football, we have an immediate need. We need a dynamic pass rusher tomorrow. Um, being able to have the most money available to at least put your best offer out there I think makes a ton of sense. And like you said, you feel a little bit better about, about what you're getting uh, with a player who's maybe played three or four years already. Um, And you know, the exact need, so you can better put a, put a value on, I think what you're, what you're willing to do there. It makes a ton of sense in my mind. As we're projecting dollars and cents, and it's not from our piggy bank. uh, Brian asks a good question here with all the quarterbacks in that room that are four and five stars. What type of money do you think Georgia has tied up in NIL? So it's a good question. I mean, I honestly have no idea. Like, if we're figuring, you know, it's kind of fifteen million a year for Ohio State's roster upkeep. I'm guessing Georgia's a little, you know, higher than that, but probably not drastically so. And you know, that's kind of what I was thinking of. Like, I think these NIL things are going to be basically what you'd expect them to be. So not only would Georgia be in the top group of like, oh, yeah, you know, it's major university, big football tradition, ton of fan support, but also there's the extra of, hey, we're kind of on a dominant run right now. Let's keep it going. Let's keep let's keep pulling out the checkbook or opening the wallet to to help them dogs, um, you know. So I, I'm assuming it's pretty high. Like that's where you want to be, I think, with NIL. You don't want it to be your best foot forward it's not your strategy for building a a program that's capable of winning at at the level you you and your fan base wants it to it becomes just when you need it it's there and you know that it's going to be able to compete with with really anybody in the country for the most part it's the emergency fund well well, well, brandon there's a a college football personality that i really respect josh pates his name he, he hosts the late kick with josh Pate. i'll give credit where it's due and he says from his sources in the industry a lot of these top programs are now that we've learned a lot about nil a couple years on they're going to kids and they're saying hey do you want nil money or do you want nfl money what what do you want do you want to come to college and get your nil money or do you want to come to college become a great football player and then go make 120 million dollars over a 10-year career in the nfl which, which would you prefer that's a selling point that a lot of these big programs are, are coming for and that's why get the question from brian what type of money does georgia have locked up in nil do they need to have a whole bunch of money locked up in nil whenever you can sell to a kid hey you're gonna play with the best defense in the country you're gonna have some of the best weapons in the country we're gonna turn you into an nfl weapon and yeah there's other schools that might take care of you better over the next four years but we'll still take care of you and then we'll take, send you off to the nfl where you're gonna do really well for yourself yeah, that's why I kind of think, you know, this, this just having the biggest pile of money isn't all that portable. Because to your point, Elijah, you, you, I 100% agree. If Wyoming's spending $15 million a year, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run the Mountain West. But it's not going to become Ohio State because, you know, and I love Wyoming football as just an observer. Like, I, all about it. Give me as many games in the mountains as you can get. Um but there's still a difference between going to Ohio State and playing in the big house and, and playing in the horseshoe and playing in Memorial Stadium, playing Big Ten football, than there is playing San Jose State. Uh, and that's that's not a slight towards San Jose State either. It's just 
it's it's different. And I mean, the thing that we don't know, and I think we assume, you know, it's just kind of human nature. Like, oh, if you can make fifty thousand dollars, but somebody else is going to give you sixty, becomes hard to to turn down. But how many of those players are really out there that it's just the number on on paper for them? We're like, well, it's ten thousand more over there, so that's that's where I'm going. You know, there's there's just so many factors that come into where you want to play college football. Brandon Vogel's with us. A couple more minutes to Tail Varsity Radio at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter. Vogel, a, a thought from you on just what's your outlook right now or uh, months from, from closing the 2024 class? Uh, Coach Rule's got his satellite camp and, and summer camp itinerary locked down. You've had this week that's been – the, the Rezac storyline then followed by Riola. Overall, though, I mean, do you think Nebraska's done a pretty good job of recruiting, uh, notwithstanding the last couple of decisions? So you, you lose out to Notre Dame, you lose out to, to Georgia. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, I think I think for the most part, uh, one second. All this, uh, all this talk here is just getting Brandon choked oh, up. It's, it's, it's emotional. We, we, so we hit, we hit two nerves. Georgia, and Notre yeah, Dame. Yeah. <laughs> Got a little frog in my throat. I mean, I think you know some of the the tenor of of Nebraska's remaining recruiting cycle will be defined. It's always kind of defined uh, by by what you do in state. And, you know, there's still a handful of good players out there uh, that Nebraska is in on, and you kind of can't avoid that. But for the most part, you know, um, with some of the players that they've brought in, I think they've brought in guys that, that typically fit the the rule mold. And even, you know, not just 2024 class, some of these walk-ons that they've added late here um, are pretty intriguing, like once you, once you start to dig into them a little bit. So, so far, I think, you know, it's been notable that Nebraska has been relatively quiet to me in this, you know, in the portal so far post-spring football. Um, that's interesting. I think that's where you want to be. I wrote about that in our May issue, which just printed yesterday. So you can look for that if you're a subscriber. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the most part, like I kind of look at Nebraska's roster construction so far, and I'm like, I think they have a plan, and they seem to be executing it. Brandon Vogel with us. He touched on the issue that's on its way. Get your subscription, alevarsity.com and magazine. Bundle the digital and the print. Get the yearbook ordered now as part of your subscription. alevarsity.com backslash offer. Vogue's about 90 seconds. You've been going through team previews. Give us a little uh, little tease here, about a minute. What teams kind of wowed you so far as you've sifted through uh, some of the data? I mean, the West seems like a total kind of like a, a pretty tightly contested horse race where, where the, everybody comes down the stretch in a pack. We'll see if somebody separates themselves. It's, it's kind of tough for me to identify a clear favorite there. Wisconsin returns a lot, um, and they got a good head coach, so they'll probably get the benefit of the doubt. But I think Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, they're all, they're all right there. Um, over in the East, you know, you've got the big three. Mm-hmm. It's interesting with Michigan. Uh won the Big Ten the last two years. They are the most experienced team in the Big Ten uh, in terms of returning production. And they're one of two teams in the East that returns their quarterback. But the only place for them to go now is like, well, win a playoff game. So it'll be, it'll be interesting with Michigan to see if the pressure starts to to creep in a little bit now that they've done this twice in a row. Just a quick note here before we get to break, and uh, I don't mean to, to derail the conversation, but quick update from Hale Varsity's Drake Keeler, and we'll maybe get into this next yes. segment. Bryce Matthews missing tonight's game against Purdue uh, due to what's called a tightened back. Not expected to be a, uh, a big issue, but it has been lingering him over the past couple weeks. You have good stuff from Day- Drake covering uh, Nebraska baseball for Hale Varsity. So we were wondering out loud, where is the, uh, the big bopper at uh, one of the three in the lineup? Vogues will uh, run you down Saturday. Good discussion. Thanks for jumping in with us today. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. There he is, Brandon Vogel. Every time we say Georgia and Notre Dame, he's got to reach for that water bottle. Uh, A baseball update, Nebraska-Purdue gets going shortly. And uh, the one question you'd ask a coach, we'll get there. Hale Varsity continues, presented by Currency. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks to Brandon Vogel. That interview posted Spotify, iTunes, Google Play the segment or the whole show and uh, always check out the Hale Varsity YouTube channel for uh, live coverage of Hale Varsity Radio. Again, uh, reiterate Drake uh, with Hale Varsity and uh, his report. 
Yeah, Bryce Matthews out tonight against Purdue is, to me, this reads like a load management with the NBA where like they can't say load management anymore because the NBA outlawed it, so you make up some minor little injury. Like, oh yeah, he's uh, he's had a, a tight back for a, a couple weeks now, and it hasn't affected his play in the slightest. He's been doing just fine, but with nothing on the line, what's the point of, of risking him putting him in the game? That, that's how it reads to me. Is it's uh, it's been lingering, but it's not expected to be a major issue. That is like the biggest sign of yeah, he uh, he's picked up a knock, he's played through it, and now with nothing on the line, where what's the point of of he uh, him play? he has hit the ball as far as uh, many ball players have this year so of course the back's probably a little yeah. <laughs> I mean, the way, some of the moon shots he's been hitting i mean i'm no pro athlete but sometimes when i go hit the driving range like my back's gonna be pretty tight the night afterwards because you know i'm, I'm swinging that club with some ferocity i can't imagine him as a baseball that's player that's what coors is for <laughs> let's uh remind you about your friends from dire law personal injury if you've been hurt in a personal injury accident You can count on your friends at Dyer Law, the team to provide you with a helping hand when you need it, where you need it. And no matter what you're dealing with, call Dyer Law, their team today at 402-393-7529 or visit Dyer.Law to chat with a trusted professional about your personal injury claim. Dyer.Law, give them a shout today if you need to uh, pursue a personal injury accident settlement. Dyer dot law four zero two three nine three seven five two nine. Pretty good uh, input here from our friend Moonbot Seven, as he's in the stream. Appreciate you listening and watching Moonbot Seven. He is off to a uh, NIL function in Denver next week, which is cool. We heard about the the. Uh, NIL deal that happened down in the desert not long ago. That's out of my uh, tax bracket, clearly. <laughs> but uh, that'd be fun to be a fly on the wall there and, and just get the lowdown. If you're, uh, as as uh, Uncle Bill used to say, a booster of substance, oh. you're you're in that room and, and you're helping the right way with the football program. Well, then here's what, what my, uh, just thinking out loud here, my the, the thing that's been on my mind with NIL is, is this going to be four boosters of substance or are these events trying to, to bring it out to the rest of Husker Nation and give Nebraska like a, a leg up? Because you look around the country, Texas A&M's got oil money, like all these programs across the country, their boosters of substance are funding the NIL program. And I, I've laid it out here before on the show. I've done the math. If every fan who attended a Husker football game last year put in 20 bucks, Nebraska would be working uh, with $30 million mm. next season in their NIL bank. Well, sorry, $20 a month, a recurring payment. So I wonder mm. if some of these 1890 initiatives are, are going to be trying to get the average Husker fan in on NIL, trying to get Nebraska a leg up, as we've talked about with you know the, these bankrolls of some of the bigger programs shrinking in recent years. Could Nebraska be trying to, to collectivize this out to the entire fan base, give themselves a leg up on the rest of college football? And as we've kind of laid out here with Brandon, not sure it's going to win uh, it's going to buy a winning football team, but it sure as hell is going to give you a better chance. It's it's again it's um, not it's not quite break in case of emergency. It's not an emergency fund, but it is it is your entertainment dollar and your budget column. Mm-hmm. How much you spend it on entertainment each month, and uh, maybe it can put you over the top here when you go get that lineman. And yeah, you need to separate it out. What do we like here? Do we like this high school prospect better than this portal option? I mean, I I look at, case in point, look at Nebraska football last year. Last year, Nebraska spent whatever they spent on Casey, six figures, sounds like, and then they also went and got Mathis. Did Mathis have a great season? No. Did it mirror his second-team All-American, or I should say second-team All-Big 12? 12? No. But was he huge in the Iowa game absolutely Casey got dinged up but Casey was pretty big in uh, the two wins they had uh, before he got hurt he had the lead against Illinois and then you have the uh, the start to Iowa so all that's impressive so one question we'd ask each power five football coach no coach speak this is compiled by the athletic and members of their college football staff as you get down to uh, Nebraska in the Big Ten, and these are pretty funny. Not funny, but really good questions. They'd ask Brett Bielema, do you have your eye on Kirk Ferentz's 
job. You go from Illinois to Iowa, and that's where that's where Bielema played his college ball. Tom Allen, what does relative success look like? You went six and two. Yeah, we're flirting with a New Year's Day bowl, and then it's been awful. Uh, the question to Kirk was bringing back Brian really the best. <laughs> <laughs> and we get to, to Nebraska here asking Matt Rule, what do you really think about the condition of the program you inherited? And that's a, that's a great question. What is this team right now? And the narrative by the head football coach has been all positivity and I don't think it's false and I don't think it's fake I do think it's what's needed you got to build up you got to encourage and and then they've got to perform you can't just keep patting them on the back and saying it's going to be okay and you're doing a good job or here's where you need to be better all of those things are super important but the progress needs to happen with the training, with the development, with what they're trying to do. Well, that's 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 obvious. I'm sorry, but you can't just come in and tell a I think this team and this locker room is super fragile mentally because they just have never they've never won. It's not that they haven't won a game, but they've not won what they're they've not done what they're supposed to do. And and, and it's in their head. It's gotta be. So you gotta come in, be real with them but also be positive and tell them it's going to be okay, it's going to get better, and we're going to help you get better. That's the message to me that's been needed and what's been delivered. Well, well, Matt Rule's been asked this question, maybe not in those exact same words, but he's been asked that question a roundabout way, and his answer has essentially been, in various ways, Nebraska has gotten away from the things that made Nebraska Nebraska in the glory years, quote-unquote. That's been... I mean, is that a fair way to paraphrase paraphrase what Matt Rule's answer to that question has been? We've gotten away from things that have made Nebraska Nebraska, from embracing the weather and, and embracing the run game to embracing development, how you, uh, how you practice, recruiting the 500 mile radius. That's that's essentially been his answer. But I would be curious as to what his unscripted, un public relations answer would be if you, if you're just sitting at Matt Rule with the bar and you ask him like, "Hey, man, you're taking over a, a tough job here, like." What are the things that you need to change? What, what's gone wrong over the past couple years? I wonder how different that answer would be. Well, and, and Matt Rule's a, uh, a classy guy and a classy coach. He's not going to go... Throw people under the bus. He's not going to pull the grenade pin on what truly and the, the amount of mess there is. Mm-hmm. Not just psyche-wise from his players, but he isn't going to get in on missteps by previous guys. He doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Now, Scott had no worry or whim about the previous staff. He would call out what he thought was wrong. And some coaches like that, some some don't. We'll wind down this first hour. Hail Varsity continues presented by Currency. And now. And now. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time this hour, it's Hale Varsity Radio. Get the podcast, subscribe, download. It is all you. It's free, and we appreciate you doing so. Uh, the segment you want to hear, the whole show, you can catch Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Hale Varsity with uh, the Herdad family, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Find us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio or at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Uh, where you can find him. So we'll dive into some thoughts and comments with Gary Barnett. We'll sit down with Coach Barney here at about 10 minutes. Uh, a lot of saber rattling with conference realignment. Get his take also on just uh, the NIL discussion point. We started off with how the market has shifted. And I know Coach Barnett's been watching PGA Championship, or has got his eyes locked into it. So we'll get his take on the, the the second major, the golf weekend. We might even dive into some of his favorite or feared uh, dual threat quarterbacks. Coach coached a long time, and um, who did uh, he uh, love watching? Maybe from the booth versus having to coach against. Mm. You always have respect for that player, but, man, they can 
break your heart if you're trying to, to get a W. Do we, do we avoid the topic of conversation of how much those Nebraska Colorado tickets are as of right now? No, we are. We're gonna. No, we're gonna get. We're gonna get because I I saw some uh, some Colorado fans making jokes saying, well, they were. Uh, they were unsure how they're going to pay Dion Sally. Well, now we know they're going to jack up ticket prices for Nebraska, Colorado, make us pay five hundred dollars to sit in the little. Somebody, bowl. speaking of collectives, hooked Coach Prime up with the mo- the mother of all monster trucks. He was on on Twitter this week, so that's cool. No, we're going to dive into to Nebraska, a lot of Nebraska, Colorado for sure. And I've seen way too many jokes with with Dion on the what are you compensating for with the uh, the big old truck. Nah. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave Coach Prime alone. Yeah. Exactly. Here. Exactly. It's a, it's, <laughs> it's low hanging fruit, folks. Yeah. So no, I um, I think uh, no, we'll get into because because Coach Barnett's been doing radio for the Buffs for a long time and talking to him when we were out in Boulder four years ago. It'll be four years ago. Wow. Time flies. Right for that 2019 game, and I mean, we all saw it. Those of you that went, we were in the press box. It was all red. Now, it didn't go the way you wanted it to go if you're a Nebraska fan where you blow a 20-point lead, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen in Boulder. It's going to happen. Nebraska fan is going to say, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. You need another zero, fine. Good. We'll, we'll do that. And it's even juicier because of, of prime and rule. I, I love this matchup. It's Nebraska. It's Colorado. Uh, we're 100 days from, from the season starting. Uh, opener against Minnesota is going to be great. going to be a fun, fun season. I know we've said that every year, but it's okay to believe it can be a fun season in 2023. You've been through this, this turnstile before with a new coach and a new coach and a new coach and new hope, and I get it, but we'll see what gets put together. A lot of detail by Coach Rule which is a great thing, and hey, uh, it can only go a different direction from what it's been and what it's been trending. Let's be honest. I know 3-9 and nine and 4-8 and eight has been what Nebraska fans have wanted, but you can still look and find little small fun moments in those seasons. Might not be as fun as it was whenever you're competing for national championships, but let's be honest, anytime Husker football season's here, it's going to be fun one way or another. Uh, well, then it, it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a fan. Hour two, Coach Barnett next. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Back with you, Tower 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Coach Ron Brown joins us here in about 25 minutes. We say hi to Hall of Fame coach at Northwestern and at Colorado, Gary Barnett with us. Coach, what are we up to? How are you doing? Doing well, Chris. Uh, getting ready for the big migration back to Colorado here in a couple days. So, you know, packing them up, trying to you know, get everything done to get ready. And so still nice weather here. Got a little golf in, but uh, getting ready for that migration. Man, you're uh, you're getting boulder bound, and that's where we're going to start. What's your uh, your thought here on the, the old ticket prices for September 9th? You know, I didn't see them, Chris. Are they are they down to twenty five bucks or something? <laughs> <laughs> Far from uh, no, not 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 at all. What's the number? What's the latest number, Elijah? Oh, uh, we're talking over five hundred dollars to get in. Okay, so uh, and then we're talking somewhere in the six seven hundred dollar range if you want to sit in that lower bowl. Okay, all right. What uh, what what's the uh, what's memory say to you about the the most? lucrative ticket number you were a part of when you were there was it miami was it a nebraska game anything uh, crazy uh, stick out to you you know what chris i was the last one to know any of that <laughs> you were kind of busy so, <laughs> i didn't i didn't have any clue what it cost to go to a game and you know i didn't you know i didn't even nobody asked me about it nobody told me about it so i didn't say anything about it i had no clue so I was just trying to get somebody to block the guy across from 
That was about it. That's uh, that's a good answer. <laughs> You're telling me the coaching staff doesn't have to pay for their own tickets? No, of course it's a not. Revelation to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Well, so, I don't think we were having to pay that kind of money. Uh, you know, I think we got a little better price on that stuff than what's going out on StubHub or whatever. Mm. But, uh, you know, I think probably the biggest ticket was always the Nebraska game, to tell you the truth. Whether it was home or away, it was it, that was going to cost everybody more because we knew it was going to be a sellout no matter what. Did the home field element bother you if uh, the uh, – enemy territory got invaded as in you look at nebraska and there's twenty thousand nebraska fans at your home field or when you were starting out at northwestern uh, i assume iowa would travel or ohio state did that did that tick you off you, you know it, at at uh, colorado it did after a while um when we got good mm-hmm. um when i was with coach mac and then when i came back we we pretty much had that problem solved. We didn't, you know, it never seemed like it was that many. I think it was had more to do with fans and the wives. I know my wife was always mad when other wives sold their tickets to Nebraska fans. Um, that was always a problem at Northwestern. We were just happy to see anybody show up. So it was, uh, you know, there, I mean, uh, we, we it was cool just to have the stadium somewhat fill. We didn't care what color was in there. It's, just nice to play in front of a packed house if we could get one. Now, is there an element from an opposing coaching staff of respect to the Husker fans for making the journey out and going and supporting their team away from home, or is it more that thought of, you know, who the hell are these crazy people coming to watch this football game 12 hours away? Oh, no, it's totally out of respect. It was, uh, you know, was wish we traveled this way. I wish, uh, you know, I wish our fans bought more tickets, that kind of thing. No, I think it was a total respect for, for, uh, uh, fans that that followed their teams like that. Wisconsin was much like that when we were in Chicago. Uh, Ohio State traveled pretty well. Iowa was always great, um, but yeah, Nebraska in in the Big Twelve was the team that traveled the best. I thought of all all the programs. So no, it was a great deal of respect for them. We, you know, I think all of us in the sport uh, just admired fan bases like that. I mean, we all wanted ours to be. Be like Nebraska's, for example. Gary Barnett, few minutes with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, what uh, what's your reaction to the, the Pac-12 uh, allowing uh, extra access? That's pregame, that's halftime, that's behind the curtain, behind the scenes access with Fox and ESPN. Is that something you'd have been a fan of? Probably not. Uh, but uh, I, whether, you know, it probably leads to, to more money for everybody, and I guess that's why they do it, uh, trying to get an edge up. But, uh, you know, and they just got to get on more TV stations, mm-hmm. more TVs uh, through the various ways of doing it, and, you know, whether it's cable or they've got to get on cable, they've got to get on direct TV. That's the best thing. I don't care who goes in there before or after or during but I would not have been a fan of it. Uh, but, you know, I, we would have survived it, I'm sure. Mm. Well, the distraction part, and that's that's one thing that, I mean, Coach Prime's been doing for a while uh, between uh, streaming services, kind of following him around. I mean, he's branded and he's got guys used to, to being on, or there is footage, almost a hard knocks feel to the programs he's been a part of. No, no question. Uh, but you know, uh, we're, I would have been different than Coach Sanders. But and maybe I wouldn't have been successful uh, in today's world. But um, that just wasn't anything that was important to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if my athletic director said I had to do it, then I would do it. But uh, today's world is completely different. And um, you know, I admire those guys who who are uh, out ahead of everybody else. And doing these things, I, I uh, you know, I admire Coach Sanders for what he's doing. Um, I, I just have to put myself in it and have to be solving day-to-day problems before I could see that as being something that I would want to do. Mm-hmm. But um, you, you know, that's what today's world calls for, and they're at the very top of the game of doing that. One of the reasons that, you know, I know that we felt like he was going to be a 
um, you know, a good selection for us was he was way ahead of, way ahead of everybody in NIL and in using the portal. And I think it's shown up that way so far as well. Uh, Coach, you talk about things that, that you would do if you put yourself in, in Coach Sanders' shoes. And I, I got to ask, would you be investing in a, a giant truck in the city of Boulder? I'm not familiar with living in this city. Is that something that's <laughs> needed in a city like Boulder? Well, you know, you're dangling this worm out in front of me, Elijah. <laughs> uh, so I don't. My own thoughts on that were I don't think I would endear too many people in Boulder by driving that truck around. So uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't do that. But, you know, it's a different world. It's it's 20 years later. So uh, what the heck? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't have done it, though. Well, if you're in Boulder, all it is is, is he ain't hard to find. You just find the big truck. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know, and maybe the fumes coming out of it, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that it just doesn't seem to be a good fit in Boulder. But you never know; maybe we're changing. Well, listen, like the first few hours he was in Boulder, his Lamborghini was sliding sideways on a hill. So at least he's upgraded the four wheel drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't have very many sports cars in uh, in in Boulder just because of the weather, but uh, you can have just about anything, but. You know the the big truck. I you know who knows. I guess I would probably guess that that's what kids like to see, mm-hmm. and that's why he's doing it. He's all about recruiting and about the the social media piece of it. So he's way ahead of where I would be well, probably. Love it or hate it, just about everyone in the country knows what Coach Prime's latest purchase was. It was a big that's old exactly truck. Right. Everybody knows what he's doing and where he is. So you know, all of a sudden, our program is being uh, talked about, spoken about. We're, we're relevant all of a sudden. We haven't played a game yet, but we're relevant. And uh, it wasn't like that before. Hmm. Gary Barnett with us here. Hey, Omar City Radio, a couple more minutes with Coach. Wanted to ask you what you believe with uh, the, the ACC. There's been some loud saber rattling. Mr. Phillips, uh, and I know you know him well from his Northwestern days, uh, has had to, to calm down some ACC teams they're disgusted about the, the gap. $30 million, I think, is the number annually per team uh, where the ACC's at compared to what the Big Ten and the SEC are doing. And you've got some pretty prime universities that were exploring their grant of rights, and that's lasting all the way into the mid-2030s. Uh, I don't know that they can buy their way out, but they've voiced their displeasure. Well, you could you almost knew that was coming, though, Chris. When they signed that long-term contract, and all of a sudden uh, the SEC and the Big 12, or excuse me, the Big 10 did what they did, even the Big 12 to some extent. But, you, you know, um, both sides uh, rattling sabers, I, it's only going to end in some form of revenue sharing is what it's going to be. And, um, you know, it's it can't go anywhere else. How soon will it get there? You know, I don't know. I would have said, it may be five or seven years. It may be sooner than that with as much uh, noise that's being made in it. But it'll be revenue sharing. Players will share in it. They'll be, they'll be uh, employees. They'll have a collective bargaining. NIL will just go to the very best players. I mean, it's, you can just see it coming, and each day we're getting closer to it. And it's, it's probably going to happen faster than we thought it was, but it's going to happen. Do you think the setup – is best right now with equal payment to all parties, all, all teams within a conference, or should the teams that carry the water get more? You've, you, you, you've, been, on, you've been on both sides because Northwestern, until you built them up into a winner, wasn't performing, and then they did. And then when you were in Colorado, you were winning. You and Nebraska, along with Texas, were the, were the big three. Well, you know, Chris, it's sort of like communism versus capitalism. That's right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not you know, calling you a communist, you I promise. Just be careful how you answer it. <laughs> so you might as well just get ready. It's, it, I mean, it, it, when they let Oregon and Washington come into the Big Ten, which is going to happen, they're not going to get a full share. You know, just like you guys didn't get a full share when you went in. Uh, but SC and UCLA did, so everybody's mad about that. So it's uh, you know it's it's going to be a big political war out there. But it's basically communism versus capitalism. 
Well, that's it, it is. And, and Coach Barnett's not picking sides. No, I love it. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm smarter than that, Elijah. Coach, want to get your thoughts here on the PGA Championships. Uh, I know uh, round one going on. Have you ever played out at Oak Hill at Rochester? I have not. I've only I played at Wingfoot in New York. I played Shinnecock and and National. Uh, you know, out out on the island. Mm-hmm. I um. But it's it's great golf, you know. The three courses I played there are just fabulous. They're top twenty courses in the country. But I have not played Oak Hill and um, have no idea. But it looks interesting, if it, you know, from what I've seen so far. Would, well, would you rather? Let's say you could get a chance to play a round at Oak Hill for five hundred dollars. Would you rather play that round or go to Nebraska versus Colorado? He'll be there. <laughs> it's a hypothetical. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know what? I'm probably going to play that golf round. Uh, I, I can watch that game on television. I respect nothing. the honesty. I love that. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm, I'm good. All right, you're packing for Boulder. Uh, where, where are you playing this weekend? Are you going to be swinging the clubs in, in Colorado, or are you taking the weekend off? No, oh no, I'm not taking a weekend off. You can't. You know, you, you gotta. You, you know, you got two choices, Chris. You can either rust out or wear out. <laughs> and I, I'm. I'm going to wear out. I ain't rusting out. So, uh, I, no, I'll play uh, tomorrow. I'll play today. play tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday. Monday may be tough. Uh, and then Tuesday I'm on a plane. So yeah. uh, I'll get three days in the next three. Well, good, good. Uh, you told me not to keep score this past weekend with my golf game. I didn't, but I drafted uh, the right partner, Nate the Great. Oh, so, I was going to say uh, vodka? No. Well, <laughs> uh, my, my partner carried me because he he's incredible. And uh, we won uh, 16 of the 18 holes uh, that we played. Uh, Brett and Jaybird, if you're listening, yes, I drafted the right partner. So we had a good weekend is what I'm saying, Coach. Well, what what kind of uh, shekels did you win there, buddy? I don't care how many holes you won. What was the bet? <laughs> well, they they said, well, it's us two versus you, and they said they wanted ten grand a hole, and I'm like, sure, because I knew Nate was my partner. We're still trying to collect. <laughs> good luck with that one. Yeah, we'll be we'll be trying for a long time. Gary Barnett with his coach. Have a good weekend. Travel safe, and thanks for a few minutes today. All right, guys. Great being with you. All right. Take care. There he is, Gary Barnett. Covered it all, man. I loved it. And the, I, I got to say, respect his honesty. I, I put him in a tough spot with a couple of those questions. Well, the Dion truck is kind of all the rage there, but at least Dion's upgraded the four-wheel drive. And, and he does make a good point of like whether or not you think the truck is stupid. It, it's, it served its intended purpose, which is it went sort of viral among the college football community. Everyone's talking about this big old truck that Dion just bought. It served its intended purpose. Love him or hate him. You're going to hear about Dion, and, and sometimes name recognition is half the battle in college I, football. I like Coach Prime. I've always liked Coach Prime. It's just going to be fascinating to see how he, how quickly he does it and how long he does it. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is if, if he gets some winning, don't kid yourself, someone's going to come running for him. And that was that was the talk even before Colorado entered the picture, wasn't it, that Hey, if you're Miami, why don't you? Why don't they were waiting on Cristobal, and and he ended up coming back home. But if you're Miami, just to stick it to Florida State, why wouldn't you go hire Dion? And and Prime's got a few uh, kids that left Florida State from the portal. Uh, reminder to get buckled up. One of every three fatal crashes in Nebraska involves an alcohol impaired driver. Why take chances if you drink? Don't drive. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. We keep rolling. The great Ron Brown coming up, longtime Nebraska assistant with his next on Hale Varsity. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency, longtime assistant coach at Nebraska, director of player support and outreach. We say hi to Ron Brown again here on Hale Varsity. Coach, how's it going? I'm great, Smitty. How you doing, man? We're good. Good to be with you. It's good to be with you. It's good to run you down and always love uh, talking some ball with you. And uh, I got to ask, things seem to, to kind of just, well, shoot forward with just how quick the spring is gone. We're already into mid-May. And wanted to get your thoughts on, on how spring wrapped up on your end with 
Nebraska putting uh, spring to bed and a little time off, and now uh, summer session not, not too far away. Yeah, somebody, uh, springtime is interesting these days, man. <laughs> and I think that's true for every college team in America because of the transfer portal, um, you know, players coming in early, for, uh, you know, leave, let, letting their their final semester in high school, graduating like in January and coming to, to college early. I mean, there's a lot of new faces in spring balls all over America. And, and that transfer portal is something else. And it, sometimes uh, there's so much transferring that you end up getting your own players back, the guys that you had originally. Mm-hmm. So, so it's, uh, I, I think spring ball is really uh, very strategic and crucial because you really have to measure uh, a lot of new faces. Mm-hmm. And you've got to be able to use the number of practices that you get uh, to the highest level uh, maximizing every uh, every inch and every second, just so that you can find out what you got before you end up, enter into the season. Can you touch on just what the extra practices did back when there were more? It's just a different world of college football now, not only with contact rules, but just the amount of time you get with guys. Evaluation was always important in spring. And, and that, you know, here in Nebraska, and I've been here – 30 years now, back in the day when I first got here with uh, Coach Osborne, it was about evaluation and development. Development was huge. And and really, you could call our bowl practices a pre-spring practice that was kind of, that kind of served the same, same purpose. We would have scrimmages just among those younger players sometimes during bowl practices all of the underclassmen, those extra bowl practices, getting ready for a bowl game, served as spring ball, in a sense, getting ready for the next year. Um, our football team has not been to bowl games in the last few years, so spring ball for us literally is very important because we need practice out on that field with pads on, and we need fundamentals, we need to be coming off the ball with great pad level, all those kinds of things that you get with live football, you need it during spring football. And I really feel like Coach Rule did a really good job uh, with the physicality piece, the technique, uh, attention to detail, coming off the ball, being physical, all those things that you need to do uh, during spring ball to get yourself prepared for uh, tough uh, sledding in the fall. Is is the Big Ten – what you envisioned it to be. You've you've been around it a while now with with the transition from the Big 12, just how physical it is, not only when you open uh, conference play, presumably in late September, but getting to that grinder that's been November for for every team in the league. There's two things about the the Big Ten Conference that really has impressed me. Uh, And I've been in, you know, the Big 8, the Big 12, um, and uh, the Big Ten in the years that I've been at Nebraska. And there's no question uh, it's a very physical conference. Uh, but the other thing, Schmitty, in, in terms of physicality that um, people don't realize sometimes is how well coached it is. The A gap, the B gap, the C gap, space out in the, in the perimeter, um, vertical, horizontally, across the board, it's extremely well coached. You seldom see see, uh, busted, blown coverages. You seldom see an A-gap not filled. You seldom see uh, just gimmies that the defense gives you, for example, if you're speaking from an offensive Mm -hmm. side, uh, and, and, and vice versa. The special teams are good. So technique, uh, strategic stuff, um, basic foundational things, not beating yourself, that's all been inherent in the Big Ten since I've been there. And, and then the other thing that you'll see in this conference, not only the physicality, not only how well coached it is, but the talent is a lot better than we get credit for. They were what? How many uh, first-round draft picks uh, from the Big Ten this, uh, in this past NFL draft the other day? Um, quite a few. I mean, there's, there's definitely talent. And guess what? 
We got more coming. We got those West Coast, West Coast schools coming in here with talent and good coaching, all those kinds of things. So this this league not not only has it been a great league, but it's it's only getting better. Coach Ron Brown's with us here at Hale Varsity Radio and. Coach, you mentioned the fact that you've now coached in, in three conferences during your time at Nebraska, and you're now under your, your fifth head coach with Osborne, Solich, Pelini, Frost, and now Rule. And I want you to tell me, does that transition get any easier with experience, or, or is there still a, a learning curve for you as you uh, find your spot under a new head coach? You know, the learning curve is necessary. If, if I'm not learning, if we are not learning as we get older – Something's wrong. If we think we've arrived, um, it's it's a prescription for failure. So you got to keep growing. You got to keep learning. Now there are some things that are very uh, foundational that I don't think change very much, and that is uh, technique, where your hands go, where your eyes are supposed to be, um, effort, no calculated loafs, uh, pad level ball security, not beating yourself with turnovers and penalties. All those things hold true. The field position game, the special teams transition, um, fielding punts, you name it. All those things are really, really important. They, they have not changed in the game in all the 30 years that, I, that I've been there. Yes, there's, there's been some different strategies, uh, a variety of things, but they're circular. They come back. And some of the things that you think are old school uh, would be incredibly powerful and enhancing now. Uh, some of the things that you think are in the times and they're modern and they're fancy and they're special and everybody loves them uh, don't always work. So you have to find out what your niche is, I think, schematically. But I can say this. I honestly believe that the fundamentals of the game, the techniques, where your eyes go, uh, who you are on and off that field, what's under the hood, far more than five-star, four-star. Are you taking young men, maybe two-star guys, and and they walk out of that building four-star because of development? Are players improving? Are they developing? All those things are huge, and they're really important for us as a football team because we're in the midst, in the middle of, like I said, a well-coached, pretty high talent, uh, extremely physical, uh, only getting uh, better with the West Coast teams coming in. Uh, we're we're uh, we're amongst a lot of competition, so. Development and maximization of your talent, God-given abilities, are important. Ron Brown, a few minutes with us here. Hail Varsity Radio, longtime assistant at Nebraska, director of player support and outreach. The, the, the niche that Nebraska had was the option game and the mobile quarterback. Other teams in some of the, the other leagues, Big 12, Big 8, uh, use the mobile quarterback. The Big 10 has great athletes at quarterback, and some guys can tuck and run. Coach, just touch on your years of football and just the X factor a mobile quarterback can be. Well, I think a mobile quarterback can can serve greatly in in a variety of situations, whether you're an option football team or not. You know, I I remember as a kid watching Fran Tarkenton play for the uh, Minnesota Vikings. Uh Now, that was a mobile quarterback that was a headache for a lot of people. You couldn't tackle the guy. He gets out of the pocket, and he throws the ball on the run, or he's running, taking off down the field for for chunks of of yardage, first down yardage, moving the chains. So a mobile quarterback is always good no matter what kind of system you're playing. If you do run the option game, obviously not only a mobile quarterback but a tough guy. You know, a, a, a guy that really becomes an, a, a, uh, a, a, a glorified running back, so to speak. He's got to have great ball security. He's got to be a tough guy. He's got to get up after each play. He's got to shake things off and, uh, and, and keep going at it. And even in, um, amidst the pounding, he's got to be able to throw the football when his shoulders are sore and his legs aren't, aren't uh, quite the same because he's been tackled all day long. So, yeah, I mean, uh, a mobile quarterback, I think, Everybody, who, if they had a choice between a mobile quarterback and a stationary quarterback, you'd want a mobile one because you can teach a mobile quarterback how to be stationary in the pocket. And even within the pocket, 
a quarterback needs to be mobile. He needs to sidestep here, move here, go six inches that way, 12 inches the other way, you know, sink up into the pocket, sometimes escape, get around the edge. So you need that guy even in a heavy pass offense as well. The play-action game, Coach, uh, for a lot of years, Nebraska didn't always throw it a ton, but, man, you, you really got uh, a great return on that play action element. I don't know how many times it, it looked like an option play to the short side and there's a tight end streaking down the seam wide open or one of your wide outs would be all by his lonesome just because of that play action and the involvement with the, the respect to the run game with the quarterback run. Yeah, there's no question, Smitty. Uh, if you can establish the run game and you get so good at running the football you now have to pull other people. You have to pull some secondary guys, uh, namely your safeties, up into in supporting in, in supporting the run. Uh, that's when you have an opportunity for some uh, for some big plays. You have to decide whether you're going to play man or zone coverage. Uh, are you going to, uh, you know, how do you how do you re- how do you respond to uh, the option game? I mean, if you're if you're an alley player from the secondary and you're coming up on a on an inside out angle at a 45 degree angle, you you know if you, if you're playing quarterback to pitch or whatever it is, mm-hmm. you have the danger of people pulling out of that option action and throwing the ball down the field down the middle of the field. Uh, that was always big for us. You know, we were always what's interesting. I think a lot of people forgot, even though we were the national leader in rushing every year back in the 80s and the 90s. We also were usually in the top three in our conference every year in touchdown passes because secondaries were coming up, biting on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the run and having the ball thrown over their head. And I know from being a safety man in college myself how difficult that was. Safety men really, really struggle in, in those situations, and they have to do a fantastic job on reading their keys um, and being up on the run, back on the pass, and not chasing decoys. And now, and now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Ron Brown joins us here at Hale Varsity Radio, longtime assistant, director of player support and outreach. Coach, when it comes to, to projecting talent, is there a position group that's difficult to assess? Is there a position group that's easier to assess when you look at film when you look at high school, maybe you look at JUCO film, portal guys. I mean, it, it's all on the table now. But when you look at uh, just how things can translate, uh, I don't want your secret, but how how are you guys so good for so long? <laughs> well, you know, we we uh, we had some positions, for example, uh, that we didn't have to battle a whole lot of people for. Fullback, for example, was a position that you never really had to battle. Uh, a whole lot of people for, even though there were more people playing a fullback back in those days, um, we we specialized in it back in the 80s and 90s. You know now now you know you don't see much of that anywhere in college football these days. But that was always a great position for us because that was an offensive lineman playing in the backfield, and he you actually got one up in an offensive line presence by playing your fullback because the fullback could go left or right. He could get to where you had to get to. He was the cleanup guy uh, so often. And, and very few of those guys could have played a lot of other places, but they could play for us. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they became really good. And Frank Solich did a fantastic job. Mike Corrigan before him, uh, you know, those guys did a fantastic job in coaching that position up and, and when I finally started stepped into that position, uh, you know, I had learned a lot from those guys and just watching and observing those guys. But yeah, there are, you know, I think you have to decide. Um, yes, you want all the speed you can get, and you want great throwing, and you want all of this. But really, what you need are are guys. I think on the offensive side of the ball that are uh, unselfish. It, 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 it doesn't matter who, catch the, who gets the catches and who gets the, gets the yards and the TDs and the scoring and all of that. You have to forsake all those personal things and decide that this is going to be about the team. 
I think on defense, uh, you have to have guys, again, it's attitudinally driven, guys that are relentless and hungry to the football. Yes, you want talent, and you want guys that come off the edge and rush the passer. You want cover corners, all those kinds of things. But I think the best thing we did back in those days, uh, we, we were able to recruit. We started to recruit smaller guys because we wanted more speed on the field, because when we played in the bowl games, we were going against greater speed. We were going against Miami and Florida State and, and, and uh, these schools from the, uh, from the Deep South who had a lot of speed. So we started to take, uh, you know, defensive, we started to take defensive ends and making them inside tackles and noses. We started taking linebackers and making making uh, defensive ends out of them. We started taking safeties and making linebackers out of them. We started taking corners and making safeties out of them. And then we had to find great cover corners like everybody else had. That's when I noticed the biggest change on our defense, for example. Offensively, we were still kind of similar, but defensively is where we really needed to upgrade in speed and talent. That's what we did back in the 90s, and hence, you, you look at all those, those 90 teams, for example, most of those players on defense were NFL players. All of our defensive backs, it seemed, were drafted, and a good number of the, uh, the rest of those positions as well. Coach, do you think in talent evaluation, specifically with recruiting, it's more important to, to trust your brain with stats and measurables of a kid? Or do you think it's more important to, to trust your gut? Because we've talked with Charlie McBride in the past where he said, first time I, I saw Neil Smith, it was a gut feeling that this guy was going to be special. So we started recruiting him. So what do you think is more important in that process now when you look at, at 2023 where everyone's got a recruiting profile online and everyone's being recruited by this school and this school and there's there's – talent evaluators all over the country. What, what do you think is more important in that? Is it trusting your brain or trusting your gut? I believe it's trusting the gut. Um, but the key is to get your brain on the same page as your gut. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, because, you know, when those two start fighting each other, then you become wary. I, I'll never forget, um, we were recruiting a guy named Tyrone Leggett way back and I think you remember Tyrone, but Ty- Tyrone became a great corner for us, played in the NFL for a number of years. But I remember when we were recruiting him, it was Frank Solich and I were both recruiting him out of uh, South Carolina. He was a 100-meter dash uh, finalist and so forth. South Carolina, Danny, uh, uh, Danny Ford at Clemson and uh, uh, South Carolina's head coach, or, uh, or, or Joe Morrison, they were not going to recruit him. They said he's too small, he's too this, he's not a, he's like a two-star kid, and he wasn't highly recruited. It was Furman and uh, some other 1AA schools. South Carolina hadn't offered him nobody. But Frank and I loved him. And, and you know, at first, we, we went to Coach Osborne and said, we think we ought to offer this kid. And, uh, and Coach Osborne was like, well, geez, South Carolina's not even recruiting him. Clemson's not even recruiting him. He's from the home state. But we, we said, Coach, this guy has long arms. Um, he's, he, he can run. Yes, he's, he's not, you know, uh, considered a highly, uh, you know, five-star kind of kid. But if you watch the film, and we look past the highlight film, guys, what we, we did was we said, forget about the look at his 10 plays and see if he can do it or not. We looked at every single play. Frank and I watched all of his high school film, every single game. And we put the research and the work in it. And at the end of the day, we went back to Coach Osmond and we said, Coach, this guy, he, he can do it. He can play. And Coach Osborne gave us the green light. He, and it was Furman versus Nebraska. And it didn't look good. It, it drops the recruiting ratings down. But guess what? He came to Nebraska. He was the first freshman uh, that did not redshirt as a corner. Played as a true freshman. Went on to have a stellar career. Was a third-round draft pick in the NFL. Was a great player for us. And I go back to that, and I just say that's exactly how we recruited at Nebraska. We didn't go off of Notre Dame's list. We didn't go off of the you know the top five, this, that, and the other, ESPN, none of that stuff. It, it, it was none of that stuff. We didn't. We didn't care if we won the pre uh, the pre recruiting list 
uh, victory as the top recruiting team. We didn't care if we were 34th or 35th in the nation in recruiting. That's not how we made our living. We made our living by looking under the hood and looking at everything and getting kids to camps and making numerous visits within the rules and and uh, having a bunch of eyes on the same guy. We evaluated that guy by four different guys, our recruiting coordinator, um, uh, the position coach, the geographic coach, and Coach Osmond, the head coach. It had to go through those, those sets of eyes. Eight eyes had to see that, and we had to be convinced that he was the right guy. And it wasn't just highlight tapes. It was full game tapes. We watched him on a play that went the other way or a play that he didn't get the ball. We wanted to see who he was. And at the end of the day, that was a great choice. And, and I appreciated that process and that work ethic and that not getting entangled in all of the, the recruiting hype and just kind of sticking to our guns. That's how we recruited back in those days. We'll wind down to Thursday. Good stuff. Coach Ron Brown with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Some final thoughts with Coach as we wrap up a Thursday. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Ron Brown with us here on Hale Varsity. Coach, uh, you have uh, just a ton of in-state talent, a, a ton of surrounding talent. And just the uh, the approach right now in in the world of recruiting, even in the state of Nebraska, does it have to be different, or is it still a situation where it's about relationship, no matter if it's Lincoln, Omaha, in state, or five hundred mile radius? Yeah, it it, it really uh, relational is important, and to use a basketball analogy, mm-hmm. um, let's be real. Uh, you know, and particularly for a lot of Midwest schools, it's like basketball. You can you can fire up a hook shot from half court, and every now and then that ball will go in. You can you can go ahead and long distance recruit, and you know, and, and you're going to get a five star kid maybe from far away every now and then. But by and large, your highest percentage of hitting shots in basketball are in the paint, and that is true in recruiting. You've got to be able to do a great job in the 500-mile radius. And you've got to hold yourself to a high accountability. I mean, if you, if you wanted to make Coach Osborne upset, just mention the name Gail Sayers or Larry Station. <laughs> and that, th- those two names would send him on a buzzsaw because he would say, those are two guys we should have gotten. They're right there in Omaha. Mm. We, we should have gotten those guys. And we didn't get them. Um, so we want to get back to getting the boys in the paint. The boys in the paint in Nebraska. We, we want layups and dunks. Not, not that it's always going to be easy to get those guys. But, you know, again, you have to. These kids want to go, and they want to go win. So it's going to be important for us to, to maximize our abilities and win games. There's no question. But do you want to do a great job in your backyard, in the 500-mile radius, in the paint? You bet you do. And when you do that... And that becomes the nucleus of your team via scholarship kids in your area or uh, walk-on kids in the area. Uh, you know, the walk-ons and the scholarship guys were recruited with the same level of intensity. You know, all the position coaches were in the homes of walk-on players in the greater 500-mile radius. We didn't want to lose those kids to some of the top 1AA schools or some of the smaller 1A schools because we knew that those guys could probably develop and really help us. And we wanted, you know, good numbers on our football team. So we also wanted them to know that they would have a very legitimate chance at earning a scholarship. So, yeah, these things are all very important. And I see, you know, Coach Rule has a lot of those values because he's come from a situation like that. He was raised by Joe Paterno at Penn State. There were a lot of similarities uh, with Coach Rule and, uh, um, and, and, and myself, for example, um, in, in terms of who we, who we were raised by. Coach Osborne raised me. Uh, Coach Paterno raised him. And so a lot of, a lot of those attributes of, of homegrown and toughness 
and not beating yourself, all those attributes, uh, you know, great technique across the board, uh, no calculated loaves, high effort, physicality, all those things um, seem to, to, to be uh, things that he values as well, Coach Rule. Ron Brown with us, Sale Varsity Radio, and uh, Coach Director of Player Support and Outreach. Coach, this was a ton of fun. Thanks for letting us uh, run you down again and and talk some ball. We'll do this again real soon, and and always appreciate your time, sir. You bet, guys. Thanks for having me. God bless you. Good to spend time with Coach today. We'll be back at 4 tomorrow on Hale Varsity.